Okay, it's five past, so let's start. Uh, hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to a joint OWASP London, OWASP Suffolk online chapter meeting. We haven't had a chapter meeting for a while. Of course, uh, that's, this was due to coronavirus situation. Um, I think for now, uh, all OWASP events are going to be online, um, including chapter meetings and uh, big global events. I'm going to present about global events a little bit later. Um, so today, uh, today's event is brought to you to two chapters, London and Suffolk. Uh, here's a quick agenda. Uh, after this um, greeting and updates uh, from OWASP on the upcoming events, we're going to have a talk on the cloud migration and security implications uh, presented by Jason Sewell. Uh, then we're going to take a short break uh, and allow for some networking. Um, also, please make sure you ask questions um, uh, using YouTube Q&A system. Uh, we will relay them to the presenter. And after that, we're going to have a panel, meet the pen testers, uh, everything you ever wanted to ask uh, uh, what pen testers do, how they do it. Uh, we have three pen testers uh, uh, tonight. We've got uh, Casey, Ivano, and uh, Nicholas who are going to share their wisdom, uh, everything about pen testing. Uh, please uh, keep your questions coming on YouTube. Um, quickly about uh, us. So OWASP London chapter has three chapter leaders, um, Sam Stepanian. Uh, we have Andra online as well. Sharif is uh, currently on holiday. So um, hopefully he will join us for the next event. OWASP London chapter is on Twitter. Uh, our Twitter handle is OWASP London. And uh, when you're tweeting about our events, please use hashtag OWASP London. OWASP Suffolk chapter leaders are Wojciech Cichon and Abhinav Sechpal. Uh, um, and uh, you can see their uh, Twitter handles on the screen right now. Again, OWASP Suffolk um, Twitter handle and their hashtag is uh, on the screen right now. Again, a quick reminder about OWASP community that we are a worldwide free and open community focused on improving security of software. And our mission is to make application security visible so that people and organizations can make informed decision about application security risks. Um, a reminder that it's all for free. Everyone is free to participate in OWASP and all our material is available under free and open software license. And all OWASP events except global conferences are free to attend by both members and non-members of OWASP and can be attended by anyone who is interested in application security in general. Um, OWASP Foundation itself is a global not-for-profit uh, charitable foundation. We are a vendor neutral community. We are supported by vendors, but we are vendor neutral. Uh, we provide free tools, guidance, documentations. Meetings are free to attend. Uh, again, if this was a real um, life uh, event, uh, there would be uh, free drinks and pizza. Somebody asked, where's the pizza? Unfortunately, not tonight. But hopefully in the future events, we'll uh, arrange something like uh, a um, a uh, voucher uh, for a pizza for attendees. And all our events are usually two hour seminars. Uh, usual format is about two main talks. Uh, uh, OWASP is worldwide. We are growing. Currently, there are 207 chapters in 56 countries. And we have quite a lot of chapters in the UK. Um, there is a membership, but uh, you don't need to be a member to participate, but you're encouraged to, to become a member. More about membership a little bit later when we talk about elections. Uh, OWASP is not only chapters, it's projects. We're currently counting 189 projects, including 20 flagships. I think everyone is aware of OWASP top 10, but we have uh, 20 other big flagship projects, including OWASP Mass, Application Security Verification Standard, Defect Dojo, Juice Shop, um, Mobile Top 10, uh, Security Knowledge Framework, Security Shepherd. These are just the ones to mention uh, that you can see on the screen, but the total number of projects is uh, currently 189. They are all open source and open to uh, everyone to contribute and of course use uh, in their organizations. Okay, upcoming events. Uh, so we have a big event coming up, uh, which is uh, OWASP Global AppSec 2020. Uh, 
Uh, this conference was originally supposed to be in uh, person in San Francisco. Unfortunately, due to coronavirus restrictions, it cannot be run in person. But it is being run online and it's actually already open because it is in the format of uh, a mixture of on-demand um, talks and keynotes. Uh, registration is now open. Uh, you can go and uh, register at uh, virtual.globalappsec.org. Um, if you are an, uh, an OWASP member, you will get a discount. This is a paid uh, conference, I have to say, with uh, training courses uh, included as well. Uh, but uh, because of this is an online event, uh, there is actually quite a discount compared with the usual um, uh, in-person events. So I urge you all to go and check it out. There's some awesome uh, keynote speakers and uh, lots of good sessions and training available there. Um, next event coming up is going to be OWASP UK-wide Capture the Flag. Uh, it's going to run throughout the whole week, uh, kicking off on October 26th. Um, we're going to announce all the details a bit later, so please make sure you do follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and all the usual uh, social networks, uh, also on the uh, mailing lists uh, and on our website. There will be an announcement, uh, details of the coming up um, Capture the Flag tournament. Um, it's going to be a bit interesting with the prizes because, as many of you know, we usually run these events in person. And the main reason for that is that we usually give out physical prizes. And uh, yeah, with coronavirus, uh, a prize giving ceremony is uh, not going to happen. But they, instead, we will figure out how to um, uh, use vouchers, for example, instead of physical prizes. So you can choose a prize yourself. Another big event is going to be APSEC Israel 2020. It's a regional event. It's going to be online. It is on October 28th. I believe for registration is due to be open very soon. So please make sure you Google APSEC Israel uh, so you could register for that event. Um, and the next event after that, a uh, big regional event is going to be APSEC Morocco and Africa 2020. And that's going to be in November. Uh, for those of you who were waiting for the um, OWASP uh, um, Global AppSec in Dublin, which was supposed to be this year. As you know, it's currently moved to February, and we're just waiting some updates to understand whether we will be able to run this event at all or not. Of course, there, there are coronavirus restrictions all over the world at the moment. Um, I think in some countries like uh, New Zealand and Australia, they're a bit relaxed. Uh, so um, OWASP uh, Global Board, I think, might allow uh, some events to happen in person in those countries but generally the current restriction is that no chapter should be running a an in-person event we are all um, online we're all virtual from now on uh, another big announcement which is happening currently um, is OWASP board elections we have four candidates uh, Bill Corey Martin Noblock uh, Jobin Jabari and Harald Tsitsivas um, you can uh, google OWASP board elections and uh, check out the candidate pages with the uh, biographies and a short video message that they recorded when they answer the questions about uh, their vision uh, for the future of uh, OWASP if they get elected. Um, there's a timeline as well for the uh, voting. Um, sorry, the dates are in American format because uh, OWASP is a US-based uh, charity. So basically, 15th of October, the voting will, will open. Um, it will go out to everyone who is a uh, paid OWASP member. So if you're not uh, an OWASP member and you want to vote for a... Uh, future director, the one that you like, please make sure you do get your OWASP membership sorted out by then. Um, there will be two reminders going for the voting. Uh, it will close on 30th of October, and then uh, the results will be shared on 1st of November. So OWASP board elections is a very important thing which is happening, and uh, it is your chance to uh, shape the uh, direction and future of OWASP. We're a free and open community, and uh, I think um, it's quite important that uh, our governance uh, is supported by you. Uh, reminder that we're all volunteers, and uh, none of us is getting paid 
for uh, being uh, an OWASP. You need to make sure that uh, if you want to uh, become a member to vote, uh, you uh, can uh, uh, get a membership, which is currently 50 US dollars per year, which roughly turns into 36 pounds, British pounds per year. For students and for some countries, uh, uh, there, are, there are discounts. So student membership, it, I believe, is only 20 US dollars at the moment. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are a, um, a vendor neutral community, but we are supported by vendors, uh, by sponsors. You can see the logos of our corporate sponsors. And if you would like, uh, if you work for an organization, if you'd like to sponsor OWASP and get the, your logo on the screen, um, uh, please do get in touch. We will help you to um, uh, become a corporate member. Um, there are also a few organizations who are premium members. So these are the companies which donate uh, at least 20,000 US dollars per year. You can see them on the screen. We also had some uh, companies recently joining us as corporate members. Uh, and we have our chapter sponsors as well. So uh, these are the current uh, OWASP London and uh, OWASP uh, Suffolk chapter sponsors. Uh, I'd like to say that OCAMSEC um, is the organization from uh, uh, pen testers uh, who are going to be on today's panel are coming from, is a sponsor of both OWASP London and OWASP uh, Suffolk. And OWASP Suffolk also has a sponsor, which is Ipswich Waterfront Innovation Center. So when coronavirus pandemic is over and we're all going to be back meeting in person. I believe that is the uh, venue for the um, uh, most of the OWASP Suffolk events. So uh, I think it's time for now for uh, me to introduce J Jason Sewell, who is an OWASP Hawaii chapter leader. So it is very early morning in Hawaii at the moment. So Jason has kindly agreed to join us and uh, speak to us about the uh, cloud security um, uh, issue and what you need to do uh, and pay attention to when you migrate your applications to the cloud. So I'm going to stop my presentation now and hand it over to Jason. Awesome. Uh, yeah, thank you, Sam. Uh, appreciate the introduction and uh, just want to say thank you to uh, the OWASP Suffolk and London chapters for having us today. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, so today uh, I'll be talking a bit about cloud migration for uh, you know companies that are kind of on prem have on prem environments or thinking about moving to the cloud uh, and some of the the security uh, implications and and things to look out for as as you enter new environment. So the title of this talk is uh, the cloud migration playbook part one, because <laughs> this could go on and on and on the cloud. The cloud is a complex environment, but uh, we'll start simple. And a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Jason Sewell. I'm one of the senior security engineers at OccamSec. Uh, I had kind of a, an interesting journey into InfoSec as uh, I actually have a background as a web developer, kind of got brought into DevOps. Um, the, and more recently, uh, I started out as a penetration tester working with OccamSec. And so uh, <laughs> understood, coming to understand a lot of my past failures uh, you know, in, in the area of security kind of brought me into security. Um, have a couple AWS certifications. Um, I, I've been doing AWS development for for quite some time. Um, real quick, I want, it is is my presentation full screen? That looks it looks a little bit small. Can somebody verify? It is okay. a bit small. Okay. Okay. I wasn't sure if it was just me. Let me uh, no. let me stop this tab and reshare. So. How's that? Is that better? Much better now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. 
Um, okay. So, anyways, uh, so yeah, so I've been. This is this talk specifically kind of focused on AWS Cloud. Um, a lot of these principles in you know at, at the base level do apply to you know Azure, GCP, Alibaba, what have you. Um, so um, so yeah, uh, so the the ideal kind of uh, person who should be you know interested in this talk is uh, really you know a CISO, technical director, engineering manager, or or anybody that is just an advocate for security uh, that will have some kind of uh, you know responsibility for migrating to the cloud and kind of learning more about that environment. Um, so you know potentially you want to lift and shift exist existing on-prem applications and move them to the cloud. You want to understand kind of what this new attack surface is, uh, specifically on, you know, AWS resources. And, and you just want to validate that, you know, that you're kind of going about this the right way. Um, and, and really, you know, what's the outcome? What's the ideal outcome of this? What do we accomplish? And so basically, <laughs> to put it in a nutshell, is that uh, we don't want you to become a headline, right? So there's been, uh, you know, kind of endless stories about, uh, you know, data breaches and and what have you on the cloud. So, um, so it's better to, you know, kind of look ahead rather than uh, setting an example. <laughs> so uh, that's that's kind of the, uh, you know, the, the problem with kind of being uh, in a leader position is sometimes, you know, uh, you lead in in ways that were unintended. Um, so, uh, if, if you haven't kind of, uh, been in the cloud, this might be new. If you have, then you've probably heard of this, but uh, a lot of the cloud vendors, they have what's called this shared security model, um, where they, they take responsibility for security of the cloud and you as a, uh, as a customer of their, of their service, take on the responsibility for security in the cloud. So what that means is they will harden the data center, you know, physical networks, things like that, access to those resources um, in the different regions, make sure it's highly available and redundant and all of that good stuff that's very hard to do. Um, and basically they let you deploy, you know, virtual networks and applications and, uh, you know, use all their services on top of that. And, and they essentially say, you know, as you're doing that, security is your job, not our job anymore. And, and this is kind of the hard part of, of where people begin is even understanding where that perimeter is. Um, and, and essentially what this comes down to is their job's already done. Yours is not, okay? <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and is it really shared? You know, is, is the responsibility actually shared? Um, according to them, it's, it's all your fault. <laughs> so uh, it, through 2025, uh, you know, Gartner projects that Nine, almost 100% of cloud security failures will be your fault, aka our fault, my fault, you know, um, and, and not theirs. So that's that's a lot of pressure, obviously. Uh, but it, it's kind of true, is that you you are a steward of of your own environment and and a caretaker of that. Um, so you know, what's the main thing you have to worry about when you're when you're kind of you know migrating to the cloud? And and really, the answer to that question comes down to uh, misconfigurations is that you're you're kind of getting into this software defined networks. I mean, software defined everything, right? You're not you're no longer dealing with physical assets and physical physical equipment and, and the way that that your existing uh, you know employees maybe know how to you know uh, do things the, the same things that are in theory do them in a new environment. So everything software defined and everything has a configuration and therefore a lot of the problems that occur are due to misconfigurations. Um, couple couple more stats on top of that is that uh, basically from you know just from 2018 to 2019. Uh, most of the data breaches that occurred were due to misconfiguration, uh, rose by 80%. Uh, and, and the cost, you know, uh, in cybersecurity, it's all about kind of, you know, risk and, um, you know, how, how much risk tolerance do you have? And, and these things get very expensive uh, if not done correctly and, and a data breach does happen. Um, and in addition to that, as it relates to this talk specifically, um, statistically, the the number of companies that that have suffered a data breach are the companies that are are doing migrations. You know, they've been on prem companies; they're very good at what they've done for a long time, and they're they're moving to a new environment. And that's 
um, it, it's a lot. It's a lot to learn. It's a lot to uh, manage and what have you. So, uh, in comparison to you know cloud, newer you know startup companies that started in the cloud and maybe have people that you know most of their experiences in the cloud, uh, you know there there is kind of you know a disparity there. So um, so that that's kind of the focus of this talk specifically. Um, and so that kind of leads us to, you know, know your defaults as you're starting out in the cloud, really, really get to know uh, the defaults. A lot of the demos out there, uh, I'm sure you've seen this in other areas of, of IT and, and software development. The demos are meant to, you know, they're marketing tools to get people onboarded to the plat platform easily. They're not comprehensive security solutions. Uh, but a lot of times you'll see kind of like, like demos and documentation out there basically repeated and, and it's it's not accounting for uh, hardening of those resources and, and, and all of kind of the security considerations that go into production environments. So um, so a good place to start is just know what the defaults are and and, um, and kind of you know do some threat modeling around around that and, and learn where to harden out of the gate and, and it'll save a lot of pain <laughs> and frustration down the line. Um, and, and the deeper you get into the cloud, the more complex it becomes. So this is by no means an easy task to do, but it's a good kind of baseline, you know, uh, rule to follow. Uh, so very much easier said than done. Um, so kind of, you know, I, I think this is a, a common sentiment um, is, you know, people as they're kind of looking at the cloud, especially if you've been in IT for a long time, you're like, yeah, it's the same stuff, right? I get it, it's servers, it's networks, it's applications, it's firewalls. I get it. I just need to, you know, kind of move it over there, um, and that that's kind of true, right? Um, but it's it, it, but not completely. So um, as you move into this complex environment, um, you know, there's I think if anybody's gone into AWS and and isn't familiar with AWS, the first thing you see is their kind of like. Uh, drop down menu that has basically I think it's up to uh, 10,000 items in a in a drop down menu roughly uh, and, and that that can be pretty intimidating right so where do you need to focus first uh, if you're performing lift and shift you're performing a cloud migration you're deploying new services what have you it it really comes down to the principles of identity data storage networking and compute and that sounds obvious um, there's a lot of, again, complexity is, is kind of the, the key word here. There's a lot of complexity that goes into that. And, um, but it's, it definitely helps to not get distracted by all the bells and whistles of the cloud and focus on the fundamentals. And, and if you focus in these areas, uh, that it's a good, it's a good place to start. Um, so starting off, uh, I am, so if, if you've had any experience with IAM in AWS, you probably have less hair than you did prior to uh, to going into that environment. Um, you may have heard kind of the catchphrase, you know, quote unquote, identity is the new perimeter. Um, but really what it comes down to is IAM and, and cloud permissions in general are very different and very complicated and very, you know, what the heck is this? And um, and and so it's it's very hard to manage in AWS alone. There's there's over six thousand. I actually I think this number is dated. I think I saw recently that it's over seven thousand now. And this and this statistic isn't from that long ago. Um, so as they roll out new services, a bunch of new permissions come with it. You don't need to understand six thousand permissions. It's just applied to the services that you use. Oops. Um, but it, it's growing. It's it, one of the hardest things is to to visualize your permission boundaries and really understand what you know where your your vulnerabilities and, and and where the what we call in Hawaii where your pukas where the holes are in your infrastructure. Um, and so because you can't see that, you can't visualize it. It's new. Uh, it, it's very hard, and and lots of problems can occur there. And and most of the attacks that we'll go over in the rest of this uh, presentation, a lot of them have IAM misconfigurations as part of the attack or part of the, the weakness <clears throat> uh, that's being exploited. 
So I am is crucial. And this, I, we could do hours of, of talks just on I am alone, but that's extremely boring and everybody's eyes would be bleeding uh, by the end of this presentation. So, um, but definitely focus on it, make it a focus as, as you're uh, move, migrating to the cloud. Um, so kind of the, the format of what I'll go through in these key areas is, is some of the attacks. You know, we, we are an offensive security company. Um, in, in, so by first looking at the attacks, we can look at some of the defenses that you could put in place. But this is essentially what your you know, attackers and adversaries are trying to do. Uh, and so it's, it's good to, you know, you can threat model around these basic um, uh, key areas. So uh, as it relates to IAM, account takeover and credential theft are, are really the, um, you know, the main, uh, you know, points that, that attackers will be looking for is that if you can gain access to the web console, right, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, they're all web accessible uh, login, you know, uh, web applications. Uh, so if somebody is able to brute force or uh, perform, you know, do password spraying, social engineering, what have you, uh, if, if somebody gets access to that web console with administrative, you know, high level administrator privileges, that's pretty much game over. Um, and yeah, and in a lot of companies, I think, uh, or a lot of companies that we've seen have are, are very susceptible should an account takeover occur. Let, let me put it that way. Um, the other is credential theft is that uh, the way the cloud has been created, it's it's very accessible to developers. Uh, everybody gets access keys. With those access keys come permissions. Um, and so there's a lot of there's a lot of things to do. If somebody could get a foothold in one of those areas is getting API keys that have uh, excessive permissions or getting uh, access to the web console. Um, and so just, just kind of give you a visual of, uh, you know, things that, <laughs> so th things to look out for. So I, I want everybody to say, you know, repeat after me, I am not going to do this. Okay. <laughs> so, but have that in the back of your mind. Like I am not going to do this. It's, it's probably the, the tackiest uh, wordplay on I am I could come up with, but, uh, but it, if you kind of see here uh, the, in, in the top left, this, this policy that I'm showing, uh, because the environment is complex and uh, and people don't understand it and potentially don't have the time and and are just trying to kind of get things to work, you'll see these uh, allow asterisk asterisk is that um, or or any asterisks asterisks are bad. Just remember that like asterisks are bad because what's that saying is I don't understand the permissions to uh, that my application or the, or this user or this group actually need but I'm having problems and getting things to work. So I'm just going to basically open the, you know, the, the front door completely. Um, and so this is something that we see often really, really, uh, you know, be, be mindful of that. There's tools that can kind of check for these things now, which is great. We didn't have that a couple years ago. Um, kind of in, off to the right, you'll see, uh, you know, groups, groups and of users is a very common concept, but, um, We'll see things like this that where, uh, you know, the the admins of this group or say they have an admins group, right? That has the show policy that I just showed that gives all access to all resources to anybody in this group. And you'll you'll see things like this. We've seen stuff like this where contractors have are, are part of this group. Um, you know, a third party company has basically 100 percent administrator control over your entire organization past employees or just the number of people in the group period that you should not have many people that can do, you know, anything that they want in that environment unchecked. Right. Um, and then uh, kind of off to the right, what you'll see here is that, uh, you know, somebody has access to the web console. They don't have MFA enforced uh, and they have, and they also have access keys. So, this one person is, you know, should a compromise happen in in any, you know, any of those different ways we talked about, uh, a, a lot of damage can be done is that, um, you know, there's, there's multiple kind of attack vectors when IAM permissions are uh, excessively granted. Um, so real quick, some of the defenses, I'm kind of blowing through these, you know, I could really go into de or depth into a lot of these, but you know, this is kind of a primer. 
uh, in a part one. So look forward to uh, future deep dives into some of these areas. Uh, but some of the things you could do, uh, really, I mean, kind of common and, and not the hardest things to do anymore. Um, you know, single sign-on is a good way to kind of uh, tie access to your organization, you know, your web consoles to things like Active Directory, uh, things that you're used to. Um, MFA enforcement, this is so key. Like most of what I just discussed uh, in the the attacks, the, you know, attack surface can be disabled with MFA enforcement. So, you know, um, but we still see people and there's still a lot of statistics that MFA is still widely not uh, enforced. Uh, across organizations. Um, the root user, when you create a user, uh, delete their API keys, they, the, that account should have, you know, no console line or console CLI access or, you know, CI, CD kind of access. Uh, rotate your user keys, implement role-based access control, really enforce least privilege. It's, you know, again, these are kind of golden rules that we've lived with for a long time. Just because you go to the cloud doesn't mean, you know, that they should go away. So. Um, but again, it's hard, but use conditional policies. Don't use wildcards and, uh, don't, don't use the administrator access, uh, permission that AWS gives you. It's basically God mode. And unless you, <laughs> it, it generally, you don't want to give God mode to anybody. Um, and yeah. And, and then also you, you have the ability to disable regions that you're not using. If, if you're in the UK, you know, um, and all your users are primarily there, then disable, you know, North America and Asia and all those other things, all those other regions. And then people can't kind of sneak in and go undetected into other regions. Okay, uh, moving on, uh, data storage. <clears throat> so um, there's a lot of, this is a, a big area. S3, specifically the AWS has dominated the headlines. So uh, you know, it's your, your favorite data breach news source. Um, so that I'll kind of highlight S3, but there's RDS, you know, your relational databases, DynamoDB. So some of these kind of newer cloud native uh, database technologies, Elasticash, uh, SQS, message queues, and, and much, much more. There's, there's uh, you know, the clouds primarily built around data and that's where they make a lot of their money. Um, so some of the attacks that you will see on uh, data sources and uh, specifically buckets, you know, as it re um, relates to buckets and Azure and, and GCP, they have their own concept of buckets. Um, it's file storage that you can make, you know, globally, literally globally readable and writable. Um, and so those are obviously a, a you know, prime target data exfiltration because of what's stored in these things, resource tampering and, and payload staging to uh, if, if they have a foothold in that environment. So we'll, we'll kind of take a look at uh, some of the things that you've probably heard of in terms of, you know, these, these attack vectors. Uh, so bucket enumeration is that it's, you know, again, these, these, all these buckets have public uh, URLs. It's very easy to guess what these URLs are with, you know, word lists and brute force uh, methods. And so, uh, there's a, if you haven't heard, there's a, a, ha a site called gray hat warfare. They've essentially gone and just scanned, uh, S3 buckets only. This is just AWS, uh, for, for years now. And they've, uh, they've basically compromised 200, almost 300,000, uh, publicly readable buckets and exfiltrated, uh, 3.639 billion files out of those buckets. That's a lot. Um, some of these are public by design, you know, they're, they're serving static websites, what have you, but a lot of these were not meant to be public. And, and this is, you're looking at, at data breaches and the scope of data breaches that have happened over the last several years and it's publicly accessible. There's, you know, um, Twilio. Uh, so this is, so resource tampering, this is something that was in the news recently that, uh, that you may be familiar with. Uh, so what this is, you know, the, one of the good things about S3, it's globally redundant. It's highly available. You know, all of the, the buzzwords that developers love and, um, say that they have to have, uh, I've been there. I, again, I'm not, I'm not criticized. I've, I've been that person. I, I was a developer. Um, they, and so they, you know, you get benefits, but, um, 
what Twilio had was they they had right public write access to a bucket. And what they did with that bucket was they served JavaScript to uh, to their end users as part of like a CDN, right? Um, and it, it improved the, the performance of their application. However, that uh, the bucket had write access. So, so what somebody did was they downloaded the legitimate uh, file, JavaScript file, they modified it and put in some uh, some tracking code, and then they uploaded it back to the bucket. And so the application, that you know the user application has no idea that that file has been modified. There's nothing in place to uh, to detect that 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 happened, and uh, and it was very easy. I mean that's that's a basic basic attack. But um, but Twilio you know has quite a large user base, so a lot of people were immediately affected by that. Um, and again, it's IM. This you know that that would have been easily avoided with IM. So data exfiltration. This is my favorite slide. Like uh, this is uh, this is an actual uh, Dow Jones had a data breach for 2.4 million records with lots of uh, PII in there, um, and li literally this is this is the diagram. Uh, you had an Elastic Search Search service uh, with 2.4 million records that was open and accessible to the entire internet with no authentication. <laughs> so uh, you know this is it doesn't get any easier than this and. Uh, but that was that that was a bad one, um, and, and and also uh, you know for for context on this one, this was done by a contractor, um, and that is often the case when when people have uh, you know tight deadlines and need to expand their teams rapidly, and they need subject matter experts to come in because it's a new environment. Um, so you know again, uh, be careful and and make sure that you have controls in place to that even if you're bringing in. Uh, people that they're, you know, they're subject to peer review and and things like that because um, this, like I said, it doesn't get any easier than this. Um, okay, so some of the defenses that you can put in place for again S3 AWS specifically, uh, they they're rolling out new controls and and they actually rolled out three new controls this week. So again, that they are doing their responsibility somewhat and actually, you know, helping the community by adapting quickly and when AWS or when the cloud implements new security control, it's implemented for all of their customers. And that, that's one of the cool things about the cloud, but it's it's hard to keep track of. Um, so turn on block public access a, as a default, that will prevent a lot of these things, but that didn't used to be there. So that, that's a new control that AWS helped out with. Uh, really, 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 you know, look at your bucket policies and your access policies and understand them very, you know, at a very high level. It's if you can understand bucket policies in depth, um, that's a, a very good place to start. So um, for RDS, Elastic Cache, any of the data sources, don't don't turn on public access. You wouldn't do that in your data center. So don't do it in the cloud. Um, and make sure that you're using encryption and encrypt your snapshots so that you know if, if a snapshot is compromised somehow, it's not restorable without uh, without the proper keys in someone else's account. Uh, if you're using message queues, uh, don't make them public. Uh, especially, don't make them public readable for sure. We've seen some instances where public writable is the design by default. Um, but really, uh, again, use encryption here. Um, don't don't allow unauthorized sources to read messages or, or any data from any data source, but that's specific to SQS. And then uh, DynamoDB, this, is, this one's hard because this is a cloud data, native technology. Everything, even row level access is built around IAM controls. And I, I think they may even have field level access. Um, so again, IAM is, 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 keeps coming back into all of this stuff. Um, all right, so moving on, uh, compute. So EC2 specifically, again, for AWS. Um, you know, same old servers, except different, right? Yes, no, I don't know, kinda. Um, yes, it's still a server. It is still a virtual server. Um, it can be Ubuntu, it could be Windows, it could be Debian, you name it. Um, but it's, it, it, it's in a new environment. It, it, it's the same operating system, but it's in a, it's in a new environment. Um, so some of the attacks that, uh, that you will see on EC2, um, it's the same same stuff that we see on prem, and so this gets into the area where people are like, okay, yeah, it's the cloud, 
but it's the same stuff. And especially once you start getting into compute, then very much so, yeah. Um, so, you know, if, if we have a public facing web server, the first thing we're gonna do is, as, you know, attackers uh, is enumerate services, you know, do port scanning, see what is configured to, um, to allow access uh, to different services on that machine. Um, application exploits are, are extremely uh, dangerous in the cloud. So this still is, uh, you know, uh, are, are your public facing web applications or, or even, you know, um, private you know, or some kind of restricted web applications, how, uh, how hardened are those applications from, um, from common attacks and, and how much have you, have you uh, tested those essentially? So uh, SSERF and RCEs, so uh, server side request forgeries and, and remote code execution are two of the uh, biggest kind of things that you have to worry about. And then be, you know, being knowledgeable about post exploitation, what are people gonna do in this environment should they, uh, you know, breach, uh, get, get a foothold somehow? So, and, and there's some new things to the cloud specifically that, that to keep in mind, you know, people are using resources to do crypto jacking, uh, the instance metadata I'll talk a little bit about, lateral movement, where can they go? What other services can they talk to? Um, can they access unencrypted data that's behind your perimeter, what have you? Um, so, you know, just to, again, just kind of uh, illustrate that um, this is, you know, using a tool like Shodan, uh, this is just a web, simple web interface. I don't even need to know how to use Nmap or, or anything per se. I can just go quite simply put an EC2 into uh, Shodan and get uh, 43,000, almost 44,000 potential targets that are uh, online and, and will tell me what, what ports are listening on those. Um, and so you can see, you know, this, this example uh, that we won't call out who they are, but um, they, you know, that's a lot of services to have open to the public internet, right? And I mean, you have DNS, FTP, SSH, multiple web ports, you know, uh, you know, non-standard ports. I mean, that's a lot. Uh, and, and because every EC2 doesn't just get an IP address, it gets a DNS address. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not hard to find these things and it's not hard to search for these things, okay? Um, so, you know, harden your, your servers just like you would any other, any other time, right? Um, the uh, application exploit. So this is probably, this is the headline that really kind of like dominated uh, cloud discussion, cloud security discussion for a lot of, um, you know, the last year. Uh, Capital One had a, a massive, massive breach. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not gonna go too much into it. I'm sure everybody's heard or about it. Um, but basically what happened that this is, this is what we're talking about. This is specific to the cloud. Um, is that every, when you deploy an EC2 in AWS specifically, um, servers are given permissions, right? So at, not as a user, as a role. So role-based access is, is kind of the, you know, the identity model that we talk about that's kind of unique to the cloud or, or very prevalent. Um, and so servers are given keys and those keys are assigned IAM permissions. If those keys are given excessive permissions, then uh, bad things can happen if those keys are compromised. So in, in the case of, of the Capital One exploit, um, you know, this is this is not a cloud exploit. This was this was an application exploit, right? And at least the initial foothold. And so they exploited a, an SSERF vulnerability, uh, were able to access that instance's metadata keys. And by grabbing those keys, they were then able to access 700 buckets, a single key pair, <laughs> access key, secret access, or access ID and secret access key, were able to access 700 S3 buckets. That's very, very bad. Um, and so, and, and these are buckets that were not, they were configured to block public access. So a tool like Gray Hat Warfare or, or any kind of enumeration tool wouldn't have been able to access these. Um, but one key essentially for one server should literally be able to access one bucket or two or three or, or buckets that are related to that application. That's still bad, but the, um, but the, you know, the breadth of, of 
the the damage done was very much due to excessive permissions and um, and, and probably some lack of you know obviously there was a, there was a, a exploit or a vulnerability in the application that was exploitable. Um, and I don't know if this user had any kind of access. If it, I, I don't know much about the application, but um, and then you know, kind of looking at like, okay, say something is you know a breach does occur, some kind of uh, vulnerability is exploited. What are people going to do in the cloud that's specific to the cloud that's different than the data center? Um, you know, they're going to look for places to go and and lateral movement. That's that's not unique to the cloud. What's unique to the cloud is is where they can go, right? Is there's everything's a service. You know, you're not dealing with an actual server with installed software that you know um, that you've built, and so it, it's it's different in that sense. Is that if those keys that are compromised um, have the ability to talk to other AWS services, then uh, potentially they can you know access a database and um, and again it's that role based access. So maybe they don't actually need a login credentials to access that. Um, they could do crypto jacking, which is kind of you know spin up a, a server in a different region that nobody's even paying attention to and sit there and, and mine crypto. Um, they um, they can set up persistence, you know, with that could be an IAM uh, user that nobody even knows that's there that has a login now, and that that could be that could go undetected for for quite some time. Um, they could ask us, you know, secured buckets and things like that. So again, S surf and RCE are, are the big, you know, bold red kind of letters here, and and so as you're deploying applications, make sure that your uh, you know that you have application security measures and testing in place because that that is you know uh, really the the big target for uh getting inside the perimeter um and then you have you have cloud native tools like wafs and things that you could very easily put in in front of applications now uh in my opinion much easier than than when you're uh managing on-prem infrastructure and have to set it up yourself so that's some of the benefits of the cloud is is security is actually pretty easy to deploy once you know it's there, once you know how to use it, but um, but it can be fairly simple to set up. Um, so uh, some of the defenses for uh, you know mitigating these these attacks, um, server hardening. You know, just like any other server, uh, you know, follow your hardening best practices. Just because you're setting up network level security doesn't mean you shouldn't necessarily put a firewall on any on an Ubuntu server, right? Um, create you know user accounts on these servers uh don't don't share accounts you wouldn't again you wouldn't do that in an on-prem world don't do it in the cloud um make sure that you're patching again that's aws is not going to make sure that uh, a server that you deployed four years ago is is up to date and currently patched that's you know that's that shared security where it's your fault if you don't do it quote unquote um you know it's still a server treat it like a server um load you know use load balancers and wafts to kind of uh you know sit in front of your applications and and take some of the work off of your hands encrypt volumes um learn what that instance metadata that i talked about is and learn how to harden it uh, there's ways to harden version one which is uh in the past last year they rolled out version two which the, again aws is kind of doing their part to help but it's still your responsibility to use version two, understand version two, and if you're using version one, harden it or upgrade to version two. Um, so um, yeah, and then the last part, this is uh, networking. I'm I'm, I'm going to kind of go through this uh, quickly. We'll try to get some um, to some Q and A. Um, but yeah, uh, so again, networking it's the same old network except different, right? The, the same same rules apply you you know you stick restrict access you you know segment your networks you um, hopefully monitor you know traffic and things like that so networking is very hard um, anybody that has been or done or been around that job knows that networking in the cloud is also hard and different so even somebody that's very experienced and knows at a very very deep level, the fundamentals of networking, they, it, it takes a little bit of time to learn how to do it effectively in a new environment with new controls, new settings, what have you. 
Um, so, you know, some of these attacks, it, it, it's hard because these things start to intermingle, you know, attacks aren't done just on your VPC, you know, it, it I am, you know, kind of plays its part, um, what have you. And, but again, service discovery, what, you know, what traffic are you allowing into your network? Um, what, you know, from an external perimeter, what, you know, what can somebody from the outside uh, discover about where the pukas are in that network? Um, do you have controls that would prevent, you know, data exfiltration um, or or alert you of of that? Um, a lot of, again, the defaults, a lot of the defaults that you'll see out of the gate for networking controls are very, very permissive. All, for example, all outbound traffic, like any rule um, that you set up in AWS, the default is allow all, all outbound traffic to the public internet. And sometimes that's okay, but it should be checked, right? It should be a deliberate decision that that's what we want. Um, Lateral movement, you know, how you're setting up your networks. If, if you know, if somebody does get a foothold, where can they go? Can they jump to a different VPC? Do they have, you know, do you have a VPN set up where they could potentially, you know, traverse from, you know, on-prem to the cloud or, or, or vice versa, cloud to on-prem? Um, can they set up a security group backdoor, which would allow them, um, you know, to, to continue to access your network? Um, or they can set up traffic monitoring. You know, you can a lot. This is another thing: is a lot of people don't secure their traffic internal. You know, on internal networks, uh, a lot of it's HTTP traffic between services because we're used to hardening the perimeter. Um, and so it's, it's kind of easy to set stuff up to to monitor that traffic. And if it's in plain text, you know, uh, everybody knows kind of what that means. Um, and so I don't have a lot of slides visuals for this one because, like I said, it it's it's part of an attack. It's not an attack itself. So everything that I probably showed before this has some part of VPC and network configuration uh, as part of it. Even the, you know, the S3 stuff, you can, it has network uh, controls as well. Um, so, you know, again, follow your, your best practices, uh, you know, it, it, you know, migrate your your entire you know IT security practice. Not just not just your applications. Don't just throw your applications in the cloud and say we're in the cloud. Um, so you know, do network segmentation. Create very strict security group and, and network ACL rules. Um, you know, I should say deliberate. Uh, in addition to strict, you know, sometimes you don't need strict strict, but you should have deliberate. You know. Um, Assign security group rules to other internal security groups. That's something I think that's a little bit new. You're used to providing access to, to IP ranges and, and um, you know, uh, but you don't always control IPs in the cloud. So what you do, what you can do is assign access to other security groups that you do control. Um, and if you're not familiar with security groups that, that may not really, really resonate. Um, but again, these are just baseline rules as you're, going into this environment, you should get familiar with that and understand what that means. Um, VPC endpoints, I think this is something else that's not widely known, is that for internal traffic, uh, if you talk to other AWS services, by default, that traffic goes out to the public internet. It may be encrypted, it may be over HTTPS, but it's still leaving your quote unquote network. Um, you can set up VPC endpoints for uh, to talk to different services and keep all of that traffic internal to you know, AWS's infrastructure or your, your vendor, your cloud vendor's infrastructure, whatever it, it may be. So um, helpful hits, you know, I, I didn't know that for a long time after, uh, you know, kind of setting up applications and, and network infrastructure in, in AWS. Um, okay, so, so how do we manage this, right? And, and I'll kind of reinforce, um, you know, the, the concept, you know, migrate your practices, not just your applications. So anything that you're doing on prem, there's a cloud, there's a cloud solution, AKA, you know, cloud variant, or, you know, you can even use existing tools deployed in the cloud, but um, anything that you're going to do in an on-prem environment, you should, you should be doing in the cloud um, with the exception of, you know, physical security at the data center, right? That's their job. Everything else is your job. Um, so really, you know, think, 
think about what you have in place and and figure out what the the alternate you know the options are as you migrate to the cloud um and really because of the complexity of the environment like i mentioned um if you're I shouldn't even say not if the the goal should be automation. You know, automation is is really the only way to effectively manage the cloud. And and because again, it's all configuration. It's all configuration. It's so 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 tedious, and so much to account for. And it's so easy to to not have visibility of something that is misconfigured. Um, so you know that we have the tools now where you can automate everything. Um, it, it takes a little bit of investment up front, but it, it pays in dividends over time. Um, you can have, you know, code reviews, you can have peer reviews, you can, you know, put a lot of, uh, you, you can actually automate remediation now, which is pretty cool, is that if something, um, you know, if, if an event is detected, everything is events. There's just events everywhere. That's the whole, it's all API, API driven everything. So you can actually detect an event and automate remediation rather than just sending alert and, and having somebody manually having to respond to you know pager duty at three o'clock in the morning. Um, still perform vulnerability scanning. You know um, it's still still infrastructure. So um, so really you know uh, leverage the the tools that are out there. There's a lot and it's it's pretty cool. Um, pretty cool stuff. Um, yeah, and if you don't have like DevSecOps, security engineering, and again, these are kind of buzzwords, but you should have some some people within your org that that kind of take this on and and really own it and and try to implement some of these newer uh, practices. Um, I'll share this. This is the cloud security model. I'm not going to read through this for everybody, but you'll see there's kind of different levels from kind of where most people start off with no automation all the way to automation everywhere. And if you can get to level five, cloud, you're doing very, very, very well in the area of cloud security. Um, and some, you know, some people may never get to level five practically, but it, it's a goal, right? Um, other things that I won't get into today, but things that you should be thinking about, um, organizations, you can kind of, um, you know, reduce your attack surface by segmenting your actual AWS accounts. Um, get to know some of the cloud native security tools. There are really good tools that are developed, but there's a learning curve. So you have to learn about them and learn how to implement them. Um, perform you know, asset management, again, something that you would do normally. But again, this is all virtualized. Everything is virtualized. And so it's very hard to track virtual resources that, that go beyond servers. It's not all just about servers and hardware anymore. Um, do training, do this early, do it often, do it all the time, create a culture. Of Live streaming is on. Hey. Okay, it looks like we are uh, live again. Apologies, technical issue. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I think you were on the last slide, right, Jason? Do you want to finish off? And just yep. a reminder that there are questions coming up to you uh, that uh, uh, please make sure you answer them. And uh, yeah, I will ask uh, the audience to submit more questions. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so yeah, this, this is this is the last slide, and then I'll get to some questions. So um, I was just kind of emphasizing, you know, the importance of training. You know, train train all your people, train everybody. Tra you know, um, I can't say enough about that. It 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 is an investment that will pay off every time. Um, and then lastly, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, humble brag for Occamsec. You know, um, you know, continue to do pen testing with you know, um, it's what we do. The you know the, there is some differences in the cloud environment. There's many similarities to an on-prem environment, but um, but you should still be performing you know checks and balances and and hardening through um, external you know third parties as well. So um, that's it. Uh, that's my presentation. Uh, if you know if if Occamsec can help you in any of this, please reach out. Um, you can reach out to us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or by email. And um, and yeah, I'll get I'll get to some questions now. Um, okay, first question: How do you solve the problem? AWS IAM now has a lot of tools for free that will analyze your policies and tell you where you have given too many permissions that are not being used. Um, my answer to that question is absolutely use them. They are very good. Um, 
there's a new tool that just came out of Salesforce um, that's called um, cloud splaining. <laughs> so it's kind of a funny name, but um, I, I, I actually worked with the, the guy um, on when he was designing that um, randomly through a Slack channel, but that's a very good tool. There's a parliament is built by a guy named Scott Piper. That's a very, very good tool. Um, there's there's a bunch of them. Those are the two that come to mind, or Policy Century, I'm sorry, there's another one, three, Policy Century. Those three tools, in terms of analyzing IAM specifically, are, are really good places to start. Um, and so uh, if something, maybe we, I can throw these in the slides when we share them or something, but um, yeah, check those out. Definitely use them. They're, they're better than anything AWS is gonna give you for sure. Um, and the cloud splitting will actually show you like what permissions are you're susceptible to, what kind of attacks like privilege escalation, uh, resource tampering, etc. So check those out. Uh, next question, how much has PPS packets per second been an issue in protecting the cloud? Uh, a scenario fooling the load balancer to get where you want with a PPS kick. Um, I'm not super, super familiar with, uh, with that attack method. Um, what I do know is that, uh, you know, AWS specifically, their, their infrastructure, they have quite a lot that you can put in front of your applications that are meant to mitigate, you know, DDoS and, and a lot of those um, external facing kind of like network attacks. So they have a cloud WAF, um, they have cloud, uh, oh God, cloud, I'm losing my words, CloudFront, which is kind of like a, a a CDN distribution that can sit in front of your applications that will mitigate DDoS attacks and, and some of these other, um, you know, external attacks. Um, you know, there's still research coming out, you know, people figure out WAF bypasses. And again, the good thing about, one of the benefits about the cloud is that when they fix, when the vendor fixes something, it's fixed for everybody. You don't have to patch something. You don't have to know about the fix. It's just fixed unless they roll out a new version. And that, that's actually very helpful. So, you know, that's that's some of the benefits of the cloud of, is they do, you know, they do help in some areas. Um, but again, you have to enable these things. You have to use them. If you just put an EC2 server on the public internet, then you're not gonna have any of these protections. So, um, and, and, and the load balancers. I mean, the question was specifically about load balancers and they also have their uh, cloud specific load balancers. So I, I would say use them look at those products and you might have a better, deeper answer to that question than, than I can provide. Um, I am I am new to cloud security. Um, any suggestion for securing AWS light cell and Node.js? Um, my suggestion would be to, if you're using light sail, you're not, um, you're not getting a lot of the protections of the cloud. LightSail was basically like a direct competition for services like DigitalOcean, where it's just very, very cheap and easy to set up a virtual server, but you get almost no controls to, to help you out in terms of network controls, load balancers, you know, WAFs, all that kind of stuff. So if you're using LightSail, you have to set all of that stuff up on the server yourself. You have to install your own firewall. You have to install, you know, any kind of stuff. So uh, light sale is a very easy uh, way to get started, but if you're doing like production level work for a company that has, you know, resources that need protecting, I would recommend not using light sale and, and learn, you know, to the best of your ability. Again, it's hard. I'm not saying this is easy, but get to learn EC2 and, and using like the load balancers and things like that and VPCs to protect your application more holistically. Um, question, how do you, how do hybrid orgs manage and or sync access management tools? Um, that's a great question. That's a very uh, deep question. Um, single side on, is, you know, federated access is, is the, the most generic answer to that question. Um, is that you can, you know, you can use Azure AD to, access AWS, you know, you can use Azure completely, you know, AWS is just the vendor I'm focused on for this talk. Um, but if you, if you're, you know, if you use Active Directory on-prem, which m 
most of you probably do. Um, you can sync up with Azure AD uh, and can control permission to all kinds of different, you know, software as a service, infrastructure as a service products. Um, so you can completely, you know, manage control from Azure AD. Uh, Amazon themselves just rolled out a single sign-on implementation. Um, so there's definitely tools out there um, for hybrid organizations, but there's a lot of them. That's, I think that's one of the hard parts is figuring out the right solution for you. And that's, um, and, and, kind of navigating through all of the marketing BS that's out there and, and really identifying a solution that, that works for you. But um, but yeah, that's, I think that's the, the quick answer to that. The solutions exist, you have to, you know, find, find the right tool for the job. And I believe that's all the questions and we wanna probably do some transition between the panel. Uh, definitely, you know, um, the, I'm looking forward to the panel. These are several of my coworkers that blow my mind all the time with um, how good they are at what they do. So I'm I'm looking forward to the next panel, and I, I hope you are too. But um, but that's it for me. So thank you for your time, and uh, yeah, reach out to us if you have any questions. We're always happy to help. Aloha. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, uh, I think it's been a fantastic talk, and we had quite a few. Um, questions from the audience as well. Um, so I, I think we're just going to move on to the um, uh, pen tester panel in a minute. I'm just going to share the screen with the pen tester names and quickly introduce them. Excuse me a second. Uh, need to. Okay, everyone, so the next um, uh, part of our event is going to be Meet the Pen Testers panel. Um, uh, we have three pen testers uh, tonight with us uh, Casey Mahon, uh, Ivana Bianco, and Nicholas Donarski. Uh, so I'm going to quickly introduce them. So, um, uh, Casey has about nine years of experience of information security. Um, she originally graduated uh, in fine art and then transitioned to information security. So it would be good to find out uh, how she managed to achieve this and uh, uh, moved on to achieve certifications uh, such as Security Plus and OSCP. Um, and uh, currently she's uh, leading the um, a variety of uh, offensive engagements in both cybersecurity and physical security, uh, which is kind of interesting. So uh, she specializes in finding uh, crucial fault points in organizations' infrastructure while also adapting to the ever-changing demands of the clients she works with. Our next pen tester on the panel is Ivano Bianco. So uh, Ivano is Italian with a fake Russian accent. So he started uh, um, using computers at the age of 11. And by the age of 14, uh, he switched from basic to assembly and started circumventing stuff like copy protection for fun. Um, yeah, and now spent the next 20 years in IT ops uh, and uh, used to be called IT security engineer and DevOps engineer. Um, so uh, nowadays he focuses on penetration testing, web application testing, uh, because he enjoys breaking things. He thinks it's always fun. Um, uh, some other stuff that Ivano does is threat hunting and security awareness training. And he still uh, likes to figure out why server is down, but he will not come and fix your computer. And our third pen tester is uh, Nicholas. Uh, uh, Nicholas has been a pioneer in information security for the past uh, 20 years. He works with uh, various clients in federal, state, and gov uh, local government and uh, enterprises of all sizes. He is well recognized in the international community as a senior authority on pen testing strategy, operations, tools, and training. And uh, again, uh, apart from uh, web and application security, he's also focusing on compliance, high threat physical security, and red team operations. And recently, he was focused on development of security architecture and development around things like machine learning and artificial narrow intelligence. Okay, I'm going to um, 
hand it over to the panel now. And uh, our moderator, Andra, I believe will have some questions for the panel. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Cool. Um, that was a really good introduction for everyone. I think a good first question for all three pen testers would be, uh, how did you become a pen tester? Should we start with Casey? Yeah. All right. Sorry, I couldn't unmute. <laughs> so uh, how I kind of got started in this, um, I was originally uh, completely self-taught. Um, as my uh, bio dictated, I originally went to school for fine art, um, and I did graphic design for a while. And then from there, I transitioned, and uh, then I was a, 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 a tattoo artist for about 10 years. And then kind of in my free time, just because I was kind of getting tired tired of that industry, I started studying information security on my own. Um, I ended up getting my Security Plus certificate as well as getting my uh, OSCP uh, about a year later. Um, and then uh, from there, I managed to um, get a job with um, uh, with uh, Occamsec. And that's kind of kind of where I am right now. Nice, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ivano? Can you hear me? Yep. Fantastic. I took a very long path because I worked as a systems administrator, systems engineer, and I was taking a look at logs and see that people were trying to break into my systems, and this spawned my uh, interest for uh, security. And so I would say that I always dealt with security, but not with the right job title. So I became uh, a, an auditor first. I was doing PCI DSS audits, which is a fantastic job to learn how to uh, deal with people, how people, how different companies um, implemented the same security requirements. And then I ended up being a pen tester full time here with uh, with Occam's, despite the fact that I always been uh, dealing with the offensive or defensive security throughout my career. I, I hope it makes sense. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you. And Nick. You're welcome. Um, <clears throat> I was I was born into this, and I say this in kind of jest, but uh, I was born in '82 and in '84. I was really learning my ABCs and one, two, threes on a Muppet keyboard back on an Apple IIe and really been around technology pretty much all my life. You know, I, th I thank my pops for uh, really being the nerd that he was back in the day. Uh, but uh, started doing computer stuff all through my life and uh, got did my first pen test in 1999. I actually did Y2K testing. Um, and then from there went into forensics and started working with a lot of different organizations. Uh, finally, you know, kind of, uh, found my space, um, in the early two thousands in security, um, was kind of forced to try to get some kind of certificate. So I took the CISSP and, uh, slept through the exam. And, uh, then from there, uh, got my CEH and, and um, started over at Rapid7. I was part of their professional services team uh, early on, uh, was part of the uh, HP Shadow Labs uh, throughout the lifespan of that. And, uh, and then, yeah, I found my space, uh, you know, continuing to focus on uh, really kind of breaking stuff as, as long as I've been doing this. So that's, that's how I got through this whole thing. Nice. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so related to that, um, I know it's, I've heard about a whole range of experiences and backgrounds. Um, what do you guys think is the top skill um, that you would need to be a good pen tester? Being able to break things? I don't know. That's just something that comes to mind. Drive, just really just trying to go out there and, and, and find something. And whatever the nerd or whatever the geek technology that you're in is uh, really just focusing your time into trying to be good at it, understanding it at its lowest level. Because no matter where you go in this industry, the the tech is the, the one common denominator. The, the drive or the focus or whatever it is on that is, is what makes every person in the industry different. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, Ivano, Case, any other 
skills ideas? Thanks. Please go ahead. Sure. So, I mean, like necessary skills in the industry, um, just in general, I think um, uh, people just kind of need to do more. Like, I mean, there's, there, there's, I think, a lot of pen penetration testers, you know, that will just run a vulnerability scan and then just verify what comes back from that. And I think some of the necessary skills is that like, you know, as pen testers, they just need to do more, right? They need to look more in depth into, into areas and find more complex issues that something that that an automated tool or scanner might not be able to find. So that means, you know, having to manually attempt to um, uh, um, ins in insert malicious code into inputs, um, uh, um, uh, doing any sort of manual tampering with um, a cookie or header values and so on and so forth. So it's just, uh, you know, I think a lot of pen testers just need to do more and not rely so much on tools. Okay, that's useful. Thank you. Ivana? I would say the top skill for me would be curiosity. So the, the drive, the desire to understand how things work. And then also creativity, because you need to try different things. And this could, could be very, very, very simple or very uncommon. And then lots of patience uh, and perseverance. And once you have this, you will end up with some data that you will have to handle and, and correlate together. So the creativity part then will probably give you an epiphany of how to approach a certain target. But curiosity to me is the top skill. That's perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, yeah, this is very interesting for me to hear. I, I, I'm pretty sure that the people watching are also trying to get into this area. Um, so yeah, it's useful. Um, related to this, what do you think are the main languages that someone should learn in order to be a good pen tester? Well, I'm, uh, I'm old, so I have a preference for uh, bash scripting, especially which is useful if you are doing penetration testing on uh, Linux systems or Unix systems in general. Um, if you focus mainly on uh, Windows systems, it could be beneficial to learn some PowerShell. And when it comes to writing proof of concept as a, uh, let's say, general purpose language, I would suggest people to learn Python. Uh, simply because, well, it's a simple language to, to, to learn. And then most of the proof of concept that I see nowadays are written in Python. So even if you don't know how to write code from scratch, at least having the ability of reading Python code could be beneficial because you could take a look at the proof of concept and then say, hey, I can do this manually with another tool. Or, hey, you know, I can use this piece of code to write another proof of concept for a similar uh, software that I'm trying to, to break into. So, Bash, PowerShell, Python to me. And then everything else. And that's the curiosity uh, to, to go back to the being curious. Yeah. Yeah, def definitely agree with you. Uh, I mean, the lower level, just lower level kind of core PowerShell uh, bash um, are going to be the keys to just understanding kind of that that um, interaction with the OS, because at the end of the day, that's where you're trying to get to. But um, familiarity with everything and anything, you can get further in this by being able to re read code than necessarily being able to write code. Um, the writing code as you mature and as you go through uh, your time as a tester, um, you'll build those skills and you'll be able to figure out the things that you see yourself doing time after time that you can automate and you can put into Python, Ruby, whatever flavor you decide is, uh, is really kind of comfortable for you. But uh, really kind of as you start off, being able to understand kind of the structures and the, the standards that you see everywhere. The, the, the if this, then that statements and, and how the flow of things work um, will at least get you that leg up on somebody that necessarily has no experience with code. I see. Yep. Okay. And I agree with both of what my colleagues are saying and um, even going further, even older languages, say, for example, like C or C++ are also helpful um, just in the case of, uh, um, there was a couple of assessments actually that I was on, in which case, 
when you're working with stuff where where at the same time you also have to um, uh, bypass any sort of like antivirus implementation or or any type of endpoint security you know knowing this and knowing some of the more low low level stuff that nick was talking about you know is helpful not necessarily for you know during the initial app sec end but what happens kind of after during your post exploitation um um uh, methodologies um but overall um as far as i'm concerned anything and everything like if you don't know a language and if you just find find it interesting then you should learn it like it's as simple as that and the more and the more technology you're exposed to you know it's more likely that you're going to be exposed to more and more languages as well so 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 yes i mean what ivano and nick ha have been saying you know those are like more or less the, pri the like primary languages but it shouldn't just stop there yeah that makes sense awesome um perfect well i think there are a few questions in in the channel as well so um i'll go with uh what was your favorite engagement and why so what was the favorite assessment and related to that what was the the coolest uh, vulnerability that you found uh we can start with uh case so this is actually a hard question because i don't really have a favorite and i have a lot of moments um where 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 uh where where I, you know i've i've uh, enjoyed you know actually like making and doing some damage um so to speak um so uh i'll describe one time it, it, it was actually a recent assessment actually and this was this was a uh, streaming application and uh, what ended up happening, and this also just goes into what Jason was saying during his presentation about, um, uh, about uh, AppSec misconfigurations, right? So this server was misconfigured in a way that allows me to uh, see a fairly, fairly verbose de debug output for any sort of error messages. So for example, 404s, 401s, and so on and so forth. And in one of these messages, um, it gave the exact uh, location um, in order to export all the user activity logs. And now, as a logged in user normally in this application, you could log in and see these activity logs, but there's extra information in the logs when you actually download them, in which case it contains information on user activity plus their session uh, cookies which allowed us to steal all these session cookies. Uh, and then we were able to replay them and then essentially masquerade as any one of these users. And what ended up happening was, um, was that some of these users were, uh, were uh, engineering staff that had extra privileges than uh, I think even the admin users that allowed us to actually get to the um, uh, underlying server configuration, which also contained uh, I'm, a, I'm a stored credentials uh, for for their company wide SSO solution. So it actually resulted in being worse than what the initial uh, vulnerability actually was. So, so I thought that one was pretty cool. How do you get to like tie these things up and find something that's you know bigger than you thought in the beginning? How do you even follow the the line of thought for that? So, so. At, le at least with this one, I don't go into expecting that, like, you know, I'm going to find X, Y, Z. It's more I'm kind of following the breadcrumbs and kind of see seeing where they lead me. And and in this case, you know, once I got access to their to their super admin panel, you know, it had all the credentials for their SSO implementation, and it was just a mess. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Sorry, um, Nick. I saw you smiling at the beginning, so you must have gotten a <laughs> favorite engagement or assessment or something. Um, I've had a lot of fun ones across my time. Uh, me particularly, I absolutely love being able to do like the real red team stuff, doing like the physical uh, integrated security, use technology as part of the whole physical break and like really kind of what the mentality goes. So <clears throat> probably my favorite of all times, I was doing uh, some work for a client in New York and um, they, they had a big flagship, you know, a uh, big retail store and everything. They're real, uh, real touchy about their security, physical security, all the rest. Um, and uh, 
the, it, the whole thing started where as you're doing your OSINT, you're starting to understand kind of the building and, and everything going on there. Well, we first off, we, we actually found the entire list of all their technical connections, all of their DMARCs, uh, along with the notations of where their VIP showing rooms were from a realtor who was trying to uh, to, to rent this place out after the, uh, the client left or before they were in there. It would have been after, but, uh, but yeah, I uh, had all of this detail in there. And uh, the best part of this whole thing was uh, playing with kind of the things that people see as normal and, and, and kind of messing with people's minds. So uh, one of the days I actually put on some dirty clothes put in some dirty laundry in a bag, uh, grabbed myself a Starbucks and laid out on a bench in the middle of New York City while I was actually keeping track of what their security guys were doing, how they handled, where they came, when they took breaks and all the rest. So that was probably one of the most fun is just because I, I love actually getting out there and playing with people uh, as much as I like the technology. That's pretty cool. Nice. Thank you. Um, Ivano? So I didn't, I didn't do much uh, physical security as Nick did, uh, but what I remembered in, in one uh, um, engagement, I started to, to do something very simple, to, to, to see if I could list files in, in a folder in a, in a website. And the website was loading some files from slash misc slash include. So think about website.com slash misc slash some function dot javascript and then i removed the name of the file and the server was not properly configured so I, I got a listing of all the files in this folder and one of the text files contained the password for the ftp server so that i could actually load my own files web server and then i managed to upload a reverse shell which gave me access as the uh, web uh, web server user onto that server. And then I started to see if I could uh, escalate my privilege, becoming root, basically, and owned the whole, the whole server. And I managed to do that because they had some um, binaries that were not supposed to be there, uh, Nmap, specifically, and I leverage that map to become root. And then once I became root, I added myself as a user and I added myself as a sudoer so that I could uh, run uh, root commands as well. Uh, so not, uh, not as exciting as getting into a building or dressing up as an elevator technician, but still very, very satis uh, satisfying when you, know, uh, you succeed into owning the, the, the whole server for yourself. Definitely. That's pretty cool. Well, m my story for physical security, I didn't do it, but I had that, you know, for my team, we got tested was uh, by Santa and an elf. And I'll, yeah, I, I thought that was fun. They gave chocolate to everyone and they got in. Um, cool. No, so, no, no USB sticks for Christmas? No, just chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> that was an interesting one. Um, okay, so I, I see that there are quite a few questions in YouTube and we had one about certifications as well. I know we spoke about skills at the beginning, but I'd like to jump back just a mm -hmm. bit. Um, so people um, are curious about the certifications that you think would um, be very useful to get um, in order to become a pen tester. And do you think these certifications are needed before so you can get a, a job? Um, so yeah, what, what do you think? I know that there's the OSCP, but yeah, I'm well, a bunch of others. So I would say it's a difficult topic and it, it can be also a catch-22 situation. Um, I personally believe in education, not certifications. So for instance, I went through the official Cisco training in class many years ago, but I never had the time to actually certify as a, as a, um, as a network engineer at the time. But I still remember the things that I learned into that Cisco class. So to me, it's better to get the training and the certification. It, the, you may need it, you may not need it. Now, I, I understand that certification are a way uh, to get past gatekeepers, so people from HR, basically. 
And if that's your goal, because you're looking for a job, I would suggest starting with a certified uh, ethical hacker certification, which could be a starting point just to get past HR and get an interview. On the other hand, if you're already working in the field, you don't need a certification because you're already working in the field. But the education, the training could still be beneficial. And personally, I, I, I think that the certifications that are the most valuable are the ones where you uh, need to show some practical knowledge. Casey mentioned OSCP. That's my, that would be my favorite one. Uh, because otherwise, with many certifications, people can, could just memorize the answers to, to the exam. And, but then when you actually ask them relevant questions, they don't have the experience or the creativity or the mindset to actually do the, the technical work. So it's, uh, again, it's a catch-22 uh, situation. You need a certification maybe to get a job, but if you have a job, you don't need a certification. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I I agree with everything that Ivano has been saying and that like, yes, unfortunately, there is a kind of like if you're fresh out of school, um, if you went for information security or if you have, you have a computer science degree, you know, having, you know, one of these certs to essentially just get past the HR manager, um, you know, would definitely be helpful. I mean, like my personal opinion is that like someone should not you know, look for like doing like a million certs at once. I think they should pick uh, just like one overall basic cert. And then, and then I highly recommend if they, it looks better with any sort of like hands-on certification. So like the OSCP and uh, things like that. Um, and, and this is mostly when you're dealing with like HR managers and people that aren't really that technical that are just screening just based on the resume alone. And this is an unfortunate reality is that they're going to look at the education and the certs and then, and then based on that, they're, they're going to put it in the, in the, in the, uh, in the pass or reject pile, right. You know, to go into a, to, to a phone screening, but, um, but uh, anything hands-on I think is good. And then if you have something like security plus, um, which I think is still fairly cheap and fairly easy to get, you know, like definitely looks good, especially if you pair it with um, a, a computer science degree or, 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 or a similar route of education. Um, but after that, it's really gonna rely on the phone screen. And I would hope that the people, you know, doing these phone screens are gonna be ju judging applicants based on their performance in the interview and what's in their head as opposed to what they have on paper because that's kind of how you find better better pen testers in this in, in this industry and uh and and in uh, my opinion yeah no definitely it's a very hands-on job so <laughs> yeah no, and honestly you know um it, it's about really putting a team together too that you're going to have people that have different focuses um in different technologies and things like that so uh, i'll echo everything that uh everybody said on the panel you know certification really is that foot in the door um if you're in the industry or if you're you know spending time somewhere um it, it's not as important as when you're trying to get into the industry especially now but when, it, when you're talking about building a team, I'd much rather have a specialist in fiber optic networking and a specialist in web apps and a specialist in uh, forensics than I would necessarily want those three people having a broad spectrum of only limited knowledge. You know, it, it's really about building that team, you know, finding whatever, again, that, that niche, something in technology made you have fun with this. And if you have to do this for the next 40 years of your life, you might as well have fun with this. So, you know, if it's network, if it's coding, if it's IOT, whatever it is, security, it applies to everything that we touch and interact with and do in our lives today. That if it's apps, if it's mobile, if it's whatever it may be, thermostats at this point, I mean, the future is going to be IOT toilets, um, you know. It, whatever whatever it is in technology that makes you have fun, there's a security aspect of that. And there's there's an organization out there that is willing to have that kind of team focus or that, that person on their team. And 
if you're if you're de if you have a passion for it and you have the idea of security, being able to put the the paper down and getting past that HR, um, it can be a hurdle. Go out and be part of your community. Go out and be be part of OWASP. Go out and be part of B sides. Go out and talk to people and do stuff and and play with things. That's going to get you to a happy place in the industry as opposed to being a scan monkey for the rest of your life. That's I, cool. I'd like, sorry for interrupting. Uh, I'd like sorry. to add something very important in my opinion. Um, if you if you Google, you know, how to get into security, how to get into penetration testing, people will tell you, oh, you know, you need to study this and this and this, and they'll give you a list of books. Now, most of the most of the uh, material that you can find online, it's free, which is a very good plus compared to 20 years ago. Uh, but very few people mention that you also need to find a hiring manager who can understand that you have the passion to be in this line of work. And the line manager who, who understands, for instance, that there is a huge overlap between systems administration and security, networking and security, and who can actually uh, accept the fact that these are transferable skills. So what I'm saying is that don't focus just on learning and looking for a job. Also, go out there, as, uh, as Nick mentioned, talk with people, go to conferences, go to meetups, and just speak with other people who have the, the same passion as you. And that could lead to actually getting a job without having to go through HR, without having to deal with a manager who doesn't understand that if you don't remember something, it's okay to actually Google for, for the answer. And I remember many years ago, I, I went through a couple of interviews and I was rejected once because I didn't remember that uh, a specific switch of, uh, of a Unix command. And I said, yeah, imagine, you know, I have a high respect for the people who wrote the documentation and I'm sure that if I do man name of the command, I can actually see what, what the switch is. And a second time I was rejected because I was not in, in, the, in the eyes of, of the IRI manager capable of remembering all the switches of um, uh, LVM, which is a mechanism that allows you to manage storage under Linux. And we were discussing about automation. And I told this guy, hey, you know, I've been automating the deployment of hundreds of servers. So LVM to me is just, an abstraction so i automate the process and i don't have to actually look at the tool or the switches and the guy said oh but i expect you, you know, to work with the drives every single day when i actually would work manually with that specific tool maybe once a year so understand having a, a high manager who is not inflexible it's a it's a big thing yeah and that's end of the ramble it's no, an italian it's an Italian thing. <laughs> no problem. Um, it's, it's really interesting. And I think what you guys mentioned also answered one of the other questions that we had about um, what kind of non-technical skills you need. So obviously you said, you know, curiosity, uh, being able to network, being able to speak to people, to show what you can do, not what you can learn by heart. So, yeah. Um, cool. Um, there's another interesting question here. Uh, it's about pen testing and vulnerability scans. So um, the question is, what's the main difference and what should people do and why? Related to automation as well, obviously. Um, right, so case. I, can, I can start. So, so, so the difference between a pen test and a, uh, and a vulnerability scan is, is that, um, is that the, is that the vulnerability assessment is that um, is that someone is just going to be running you know something like Nessus, Qualys, what have you, and then they're just going in and just verifying the issues. Um, whereas the pen test is actually just supposed to um, um, you're actually su supposed to be simulating you know an actual bad actor within whatever environment that you're trying to test. So so you actually need to go deeper and do the involved work and try and kind of mimic. Um, um, what a bad actor would do. So, I mean, that might mean um, being, uh, be, being more stealthy in the environment. So um, doing things like hiding your tracks, 
um, not running any like loud scanners, uh, not running any 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 ex excessively loud um, uh, um, uh, tools of any kind, and just um, trying trying to within like because most assessments have a very very limited window of uh, actual active testing, so you kind of have to do all this kind of intricate work in a very 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 small amount of time, but. But the payoff with that is is that the client is actually going to going to get a more realistic um, risk to their assets that 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 they are going to be able to see and make um, actually helpful uh, recommendations in so far as preventing you know these various types of attacks against all these environments. Okay. Nick. Sure. Um, you know, I mean, they, they both have their, their value, right? Uh, when you're talking about vulnerability assessment, when you're talking about pen testing as kind of um, the business requirement of information security at this point, uh, penetration testing is always going to be like Kay said, it's going to be trying to replicate what that real world attacker would do, trying to get to the the keys to the kingdom, the crown jewels, whatever you what have you, at the at, at the other side or at the inside of the environment. Uh, vulnerability assessment is more of a broader tool set, uh, looking for like that low hanging fruit, those type of things. But if you're doing, say, a lot of application development, um, you're putting out applications and revisions very quickly. Um, an application scanner might be able to get you at least to a, an awareness point of what is happening as those revisions take place, as you have a code change take place and things like that. Plus, uh, as being a professional pen tester, um, we have to abide by a scope time. We have to have a report done. We have to have a lot of things that we account for when, when we're doing our actual test. So leveraging things like a vulnerability assessment tool, a scanner, what have you, to kind of get those low hanging fruit things done and then take that, either build on that or at least say these things I've, I know are done and then we can take that manual step to really kind of get into the deeper sections during like a pen test. Um, they both have their place. Uh, it really depends on what the organization is looking to get out of it, what, their, what type of security questions that they're um, trying to answer. And the right answer is just really dependent upon what the goal of it is. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So I suppose that something like an automated scan would be one of the top five things that you do when you start a pen test. Because one of the questions is, do you have a top five Voltron of bones that you, or things that you look for right off the bat when starting a pen test? I mean, process wise, yeah, you're going to, you're, especially uh, again, we as professional pen testers have a finite amount of time we can spend on this. The bad guys, they can spend as much time as they want. They don't get paid until they succeed. Whereas we, we, we have 401ks and we have, you know, the, all of those fun, real work type of scenarios and meetings and Zoom calls and all the rest that we have to deal with, as well as making sure that we get these things in. Uh, those are the types of things that, um, really, you have to leverage your tool set to help you build your tool set. But like Kay said earlier, don't be a tool. You know, you, you want to be better than either your tool set. You want to use them where they should be, but you don't want to only be as good as those tools. So uh, volume scanning, yeah, you do as part of that initial kickstart to kind of help you accelerate the ability to co make coverage and, and do all of the process and procedure things. But again, you don't want it. You don't want to be only as good as the tools that you're using. Definitely. Any any other things that you would start with? For example, when you do a web app pen test, like the very first thing that you would look at. So with a web app pen test, um, sp uh, specifically, that's really just going to depend on the app itself. But uh, the first thing I usually do. I usually do a quick functional test. I try and uh, map out the application. I try and figure out where all the inputs are, um, what what uh, software and libraries that it's running, you know, and try and finger, fingerprint as many of them as I can. And then I'll take a look through the source code and see if there's any obvious bugs there. 
and then from there, I'll start fuzzing inputs. I'll start um, I'll start looking uh, at uh, any sort of DOM objects, especially if there's uh, anything being stored to the client. I'll look at cookies. I'll look at uh, host headers, and and probably most important of all is that like I'll look at any sort of like authentication as well as like the various requests being kind of communicated back and forth. Um, and 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 this is also um, in addition to any sort of APIs that they have running in the background, or just generally what their backend looks like, and then try and for formulate kind of the various areas like within the application. So 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 just getting um, as comprehensive as a sitemap as humanly possible, um, and those are only first steps. <laughs> so yeah. Thank you. Ivana? Well, in addition to what Case does, I always try to find logical errors in a web application, things that the developer did not think about, uh, something that usually could happen, well, something that could happen uh, often. Um, let's say that you are in a portal. And this is a real world example because a friend of mine had um, her website compromised like this. She wrote a portal for, let's say, friends and family. People could register and then upload uh, an avatar image. But she didn't put many, many checks in place. So uh, at a certain point in the morning, she said, oh my God, oh my God, somebody hacked my website. Now I have uh, some kind of Illuminati um, video that plays automatically. What happened? What happened? So what happened was that uh, the hacker registered an account on the on the portal, and then they uploaded uh, a piece of PHP instead of an image, and then they were uh, able to understand where this piece of PHP was uploaded because the location was fixed, and then they just called the the PHP code which contained a shell. So the the hackers basically gained total access to the server simply because of a failed upload uh, facility. And this is something that happens also in uh, commercial uh, grade uh, software, uh, more often than not. And so I try to look for this kind of uh, logical errors. And sometimes it pays off, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, worst case scenario, you always rely on uh, um, the infrastructure part, so maybe it's the web application, so maybe it's the web server rather than the web application, the entry point, or maybe there is something else. Maybe you could uh, run a phishing campaign and actually steal the credentials of an administrator. So again, they, we, we go into the realm of uh, creativity, as mentioned before. Thank you very but, much. Yeah, but there is no silver bullet, that's the most important part. Yeah. Um, another question based on this, I think it's related. Do you keep finding the same issues? I, are there any prevalent issues that you keep finding in, in most of your assessments? Uh, I would say yes. From a general security point of view, I keep finding um, unpatched operating systems, obsolete operating systems, or... Um, uh, third-party libraries which are still obsolete. So maybe uh, somebody could uh, develop a web application in, let's say, 2012 and use the third-party libraries that are available in, two, in 2012. But then the company doesn't have uh, proper policies and processes to keep this web application uh, uh, updated. And eight years later, you still see the very same uh, uh, third-party libraries in news. And then maybe you research what kind of vulnerabilities they are uh, affected by and then you could actually find uh, your entry point uh, so usually lack of patching lack of um, security awareness lack of internal processes and procedures it's it's the issue that i see the most in uh, in, in my uh, experience yeah, and on my end like yeah so i too also see that a lot but um uh, on in a uh, much a uh, much a uh, simpler terms, um, uh, like the thing, the things I see the most, like I mean, things like default passwords for um, uh, for 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 various pieces of software, I see that quite a bit. 
Um, uh, a lot of websites will not have properly directory indexing, um, meaning that uh, that that they have their directory structure on their web server completely open, um, and then and I'm able to just navigate through it, um, and just a whole and just multiple misconfiguration issues I always see all the time outside of any like outright vulnerabilities. It's more just, I see more misconfigurations more than anything else, I should say. Yeah. Nick? Yeah, I, I agree there as well. You know, um, it's, it, it really kind of goes into the, uh, the, the fact that, um, sorry, I literally just spaced, um, uh, you know, putting time into uh, understanding what's going on. I, I apologize. I just had a um, brain fart. Um, can you can you repeat the question for me? Um, you, know, what were we you find that you keep finding the same issues. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, along with Ivano and Case, yeah, you really kind of see the same issues. And the the kind of the weakest link that I see um, in really the, the core of over time um, is the human element, uh, the deployment. Like Jason was saying earlier in his talk, really the deployment is uh, um, is, is where the, the biggest issue is. That human element is kind of uh, no matter what until – you, you can get that out until the system really understands what's going on. Um, it, it, there's always going to be someone that wants to maintain control, wants to have their hands on it, um, what have you. And um, and, and that's really going to be the, the biggest thing that I've seen over time is, you know, the, the same types of old systems being online, like Ivano said, the same types of issues where it's uh, deployment over time. But again, it comes down to really the human element in it is really the biggest thing that um, um, it, you see continued throughout. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, sorry, I think we just have about seven minutes left until we get disconnected again from the stream. So um, towards the end of the question list, there is one interesting one from my perspective. Is uh, What's your favorite hacker movie? Just mm. on a happier <laughs> note. So I tend to like bad hacker movies. So, um, but just growing up since uh, I was a '90s kid, um, hackers was was like my uh, go-to. I love war games. I love sneakers. But you know, at the end of the day, I kind of just want to see something bad and laugh about it. So that's kind of my go-to. And then with a the second, maybe being swordfish because that is just hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> my god that's exactly my same question my, my same answer to the question i mean Hugh jackman doing <coughs> hand clap while he, <laughs> he was trying to <laughs> to guess passwords was unbelievable also whole guy had some special skills i would say yes uh war games and sneakers but see because sneakers to me it's more a more of a realistic uh movie but again you know hand clapping me there War War Games by far is is my absolute favorite one. That was yes, uh, being being as young as I was when, uh, 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 you know the the whole Whopper and being able just the way that it was pulled off. By far favorite favorite hacker movie, Whopper over Gibson any day. These are really interesting titles. I haven't heard of any of them. This is very, really bad because I work in security. I should technically know this. <laughs> um, okay, well, I think all of these uh, hacker, yeah, okay, so I don't think we have any time for, uh, for more questions, but this has been really, really interesting. I work in application security. I know that other people maybe are trying to get into the security field, but I've learned a lot from you guys. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll pass it on to Sam now for the final slides. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, all the pen testers and uh, Jason for uh, uh, speaking to us at this event. I think it's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, hopefully we'll be back with more events soon. Um, so in order to make sure you don't miss the next event, um, I'm going to show the contact details for both the um, 
OWASP London and uh, OWASP Suffolk chapter. Uh, just give me a sec second so I can share this. Okay, I think you should be able to see my screen now. Yep. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is the information how to uh, contact uh, OWASP Suffolk chapter. Uh, they have a web page which is uh, on OWASP.org, WW Chapter Suffolk. Uh, also a page on Meetup, uh, OWASP Suffolk is on Twitter. Um, OWASP Suffolk is the Twitter handle there. Uh, also, we have a Slack. OWASP has a, um, an organizational Slack. Um, there's information how to join it. Uh, you can find it on OWASP website. And each chapter has its own channel, so Suffolk chapter can be found under chapter dash Suffolk channel. And OWASP Suffolk also has a YouTube channel, but unfortunately they haven't got enough subscribers to have their own uh, short handle like we do. So please, everyone, uh, can you please find OWASP Suffolk chapter and subscribe? Because if um, the chapter manages to get 100 subscribers, they will be able to have a nice looking URL instead of a long random one. Um, uh, here's the information how you can keep in touch with OWASP London chapter. Um, we are also on Twitter, also on Facebook, also have a, um, we also have a channel on Slack, uh, on Meetup. You can find us OWASP London. Of course, you're watching us now on YouTube under OWASP London channel. We're also on LinkedIn. Um, so if you're on LinkedIn, you can uh, find the uh, OWASP Londoners organization and follow us there uh, to make sure you don't miss the next event and follow all our news. I would like to thank everyone and would like to remind everyone that video recordings will be available on OWASP London and OWASP Suffolk YouTube channels. And Jason Sewell slides will be shared on OWASP London and OWASP Suffolk web pages. And the web pages are being showed on screen right now. So thank you, everyone, and hope to see you soon online. Thank you all. Thank you.